Good morning, everyone. Just had a moment or two late coming in this morning simply because I was getting everything ready. I'm pulling uh, my Shumash, which is the Jewish commentary. I've got my book on numbers here in front of me, and I've got my Genesis Passion Translation in front of me. So we are going to have a great morning. Hi, Mackenzie. Hi, Mahesh. Hi, uh, Salinda. Hi, Jean. Hi, Colby. I'm glad you're all coming in this morning. Good morning, Rhonda. Uh, Cad Chica. You want to give me your first name? Uh, good morning, Priscilla. And I think... Uh, uh, good morning, Jesse. Good morning, Jesse. I see you there coming in. Good morning, DJ. I hope you are all in for a great treat because this is an amazing uh, chapter today. Good morning, Savannah. I love it that you are studying. Keep doing your um, um, John sixteen twenty. That is uh, Priscilla. Uh, Terry, thanks for coming in. Uh, thanks for coming in. Uh, Stacy, uh, what is the Shumash? You refer to it a lot, and I may need to add it to my library. Yes, Sunny Kachika. That's right. That's Sunny. Um, the Shumash is a, let me just spell it for you. It's a C-H-U-M-A-S-H, the stone edition. You see this? Uh, that's just so you can get an idea what it looks like. Uh, it's this book. But being Hebrew, it starts in the back and goes uh, right to left. And it is a um, commentary from the Jewish rabbis. So uh, it is Old Testament. Um, you can um, order one from uh, eBay or from uh, Amazon. They are different prices. If you would get it, if you can get a used one, I recommend it simply because they are very expensive. But they have great um, insight into the culture and the history of the Old Testament, uh, much so than much more so than we, the American Church, seem to have a lot of historical background. We don't. Um, I grabbed my also my uh, biblical mathematics book today uh, to look up a few numbers because this chapter is filled with numbers. And I was talking to Savannah when I interrupted myself. Savannah, just those of you who've been to school, Savannah came for the first time on Saturday, and she's already registered for the January school, which is wonderful. Uh, but in the process of it, I, I was telling her this morning that she needs to just work her We Who Worship book and workbook and she's going to find that in work in the book and the workbook, you will find yourself, uh, the deeper part of who you really are, and it will help you overcome the natural side of you and develop the supernatural side of you with every page. It's not about uh, reading information and regurgitating it in the information of the uh, workbook. It is about digging in your heart with God and allowing the Spirit of God to hover over you recreating his identity that's already been with inside of inside of you all this time but your natural identity has become more of who you think you are and this will help you find who you really are dj i hope that helped you uh, answer your question good morning sophia thanks for coming in um uh, good morning laura kokenauer good morning a servant's heart uh that would be angela Bartley, good morning, Becky Sue. Good morning, Cindy. I'm glad you're all joining me this morning. Um, good morning, Julie. Thanks, everyone, uh, that helped me with some scriptures. I've gotten two Women of the Nation letters written from your scriptures, and I want to write at least a couple more. Uh, let's get right into Genesis. Don't forget tonight, if you are in the area and would like to join us in Riverside, California, at, at Pastor Tom and Heather Flores Church, Elevate Life at 7 o'clock, we'll be preaching tonight. And I am so excited. Um, if you don't have your Genesis Passion Translation and you'd like to get it ordered, and Julie, I have your order lying on the desk, laying on the desk so that we can fill that when they come in, hopefully today. They were shipped out to us on the 25th. Now, there's a ton in this chapter, so let's get started. Uh, Noah leaves the ark. God's heart was moved with compassion as he remembered Noah and all the animals, large and small. That's called mercy. When God remembers us, he remembers us with mercy. 
uh, Noah and all the animals, large and small. Now, in saying that God remembered us implies that God could forget us, and that's not true. God could never forget us. He doesn't want to forget us, and God is God. He is not human, but when he determines that he's going to forget our sins, he simply does it out of will, not because his mind can forget something, but more that he separates himself from it so that he doesn't have to remember it and in our case, when he remembers us, it's because we are in his face. We are continually coming into the secret place with him. We are in his face. Remember me, God. Remember me, God. He wants us in his face. Um, and he remembered the animals, large and small, that were in, with Noah in the ark. And God caused a wind. That word wind there should be translated spirit. It is the Ruach, breath of God. God caused a wind to sweep across the earth again. That's why you know it is the Ruach, spirit of God, because in Genesis 1, the spirit hovered over the earth. Now the spirit is blowing across the earth. And this happened again in Acts chapter 2. We have at least these three accounts of the spirit of God hovering over the earth and hovering over people. Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 8, here it is again, and then in Acts chapter 2, when the Spirit of God comes, and the only way the writer could describe it was like a wind, the sound of heaven filled the room, and a tongue sat on each head, that was the Spirit of God, again, hovering over 120 people. He closed... Okay, God caused a wind to sweep across the earth again, and the water subsided. So to get the water to back up or to stop, it was as if the Spirit of God rebuked the waters. And rebuke means stop it. That's enough. And that's why you can rebuke this COVID-19. You can rebuke this virulent disease. You can rebuke rebuke sin coming at you in the name of Jesus, you can say, I rebuke you. And that means it causes it to subside because it cannot go any further. Good morning, Ruth. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, there's a lot of Ruachs in Genesis, Colby. A lot of the Spirit of God hovering frequencies, um, a beautiful, beautiful representation of the manifested presence of God. And in this case, uh, when the wind blew across the earth, when the Spirit of God blew across the earth again, the water stopped. The water subsided. The water stopped coming. He closed the subterranean fountains and the floodgates of heaven and held back the rain. So he closed up the deep and caused the water to stop coming up out of the ground. He shut up the heavens and caused the rain to stop falling from from the heavens. After 150 days, the flood waters gradually receded from the earth and the waters began to, re to subside. After 150 days. Now, it rained for 40 days. The water came up from the ground for 40 days. It flooded and covered the whole earth up to three miles deep. In that case, then, the water sat on the earth for another 150 days, and then the floodwaters gradually began to recede from the earth, and, and the waters began to subside. So all of it began to happen. It was a process. It was gradual. There was no quick stop, and there was it was as if it stopped the way it started. Everything started to flood up. Everything started to come down. And the earth wasn't covered right away. But once it got covered, then it began to subside in the same pattern, if that makes sense to you. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, you know how much I love numbers. And these numbers are vitally important. On the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest... That's the book of Hebrews chapter 4. The ark came to rest on the highest peak in Ararat. Now, let's stop a minute and talk about this. Laura Coconauer, you're going to love this. Uh, Stephanie Reyes, you're going to love this. Hi, Becky, you're just going to love this. 17 means victory. 7 means it is finished. 
So on the victory day of the it is finished, the ark came to rest on the highest peak of Ararat. Now Ararat, let's talk about that for a moment. Mount Ararat is believed to be on the border of Turkey, Armenia, and Iran, known as Uratu, Uratu, in Assyrian inscriptions. Uh, Uratu, that's right. See 2 Kings 19, Isaiah 37, and Jeremiah 51. Ararat means the curse is reversed, or reverse the curse, or high and holy land. The resting place of God's sons and daughters is where the curse is reversed. The cross and empty tomb in the high and holy land of being seated with Christ in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2 verse 6. So here we have this beautiful picture of the curse being reversed. Now the curse of the flood, in other words, the judgment of the flood is being reversed and it begins to subside and reverse just like it came. And so here we have, I don't want you to miss this, in the institution of the Feast of Passover, the Lord made the seventh month into the first month the month of great importance for Israel. That's Exodus 12, verse 2. Passover was the 14th day of the month. Three days later would be the 17th day. So on Passover, on the 14th day, before Passover began at sundown, Jesus was crucified. Three days later, he rose from the dead, resurrected. Now, Passover was the 14th day. Three days later would be the 17th day of the month, the very day Jesus rose from the dead. The final resting place of our Ark of Salvation was the top of the mountain, which is Ephesians 2 verse 6. For you are seated in heavenly places. You are already seated in heavenly places. Jesus was raised on high, seated at the right hand of the Most High. What inspiration lies within the Bible? Now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and then Ephesians 2, 6 says, we are seated at his right hand. So once the curse is reversed, you take your seat in heavenly places on the 17th day, your victory day. I'm trying to get this across, right? I'm getting all excited in the spirit. Of the it is finished. God has brought salvation. It is finished. He's added the third day for the bride and the resurrection, bringing us from 14 to 17 and causing us to be in victory. Yes, Priscilla, 17 means victory. 14 means salvation and deliverance. 15 means rest. 16 means love. And 17 means victory. And so on the 17th day of the it is finished, or the victory day of the it is finished, the ark came to rest. Rest is ordained today, Hebrews chapter 4, but only a few will enter in. Will you enter in? I'm telling you, if rest has been ordained for me, I'm entering into it. I am not going to resist it. I'm going to be seated in heavenly places. I'm going to stop fighting a war that's already been won, and I'm going to walk in the victory of it. And the curse is is reversed when we are seated in heavenly places the curse is automatically reversed because i've already had the it is finished of my victory so i hope that is really resonating in your spirit the waters continued to recede until the 10th month 10 means law testimony and responsibility and in tones of the that's right that's right another re word now, as, as the 10th month comes, recede is another reword. There's several rewords coming up here. Reversed is another one. Reverse the curse. The waters recede. All these beautiful resounds. Do, re, minor third for the bride, minor third for uh, the Jewish culture to become the bride again. Do, re, the Jewish nation to become the bride again. Now, the tenth is the third circle, or the second circle. Do, re, mi, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, re, mi. The tenth 
It's the third time around on the me. So, I mean, oh, shoot. It's the third position on the second circle. Do, re, me for the bride. Fa, so, la, ti, do. New beginnings. Re, Holy Spirit. Me, tenth position. Law, testimony, and responsibility. The law of God is that we give our testimony and we walk in the responsibility of walking as one with him as his bride. The water is continued to recede until the 10th month. I hope I didn't lose anybody on all that. And on the first day, first means unison, not unity, unison. Hi, Michaela. Mwah. I love you. On the first day, the unison, we have law, testimony, and responsibility lining up with unison, and we have the curse being reversed. Now, as we go on, you have the on the first day of the 10th month, so on the unison of law, testimony, and responsibility, all the mountaintops appeared. Woo! Now that's a revelation. Let's see if we can grab it in our spirit. When we get on God's frequency of unison with Him, we walk with God. We don't ask God to walk with us. We walk with God, which means I determined that I'm going to be so dead to myself that I don't even have my own sound. I don't even have my own frequency anymore. I'm going to take on his sound. I'm going to take on his frequency. Whatever he's saying, I'm saying. That's what Jesus said. Whatever he's doing, I'm doing. We're saying what Jesus said. We're doing what Jesus did. We are walking with God now, not asking God to walk with us. I'm going to walk with God on his frequency, on his wavelength. We are in unison. And when we are, law, testimony, and responsibility becomes the revelation of my life. And I am revealed as the married covenant legal bride of Christ. And I have a responsibility to be his very image, the very sound wave of his presence. Whew, I know this is deep, but are you getting it in your spirit? It is amazing. All the mountaintops appeared. So if you want the mountaintops that God has created for us to appear in your life, we need to get in unison on God's wavelength and walk with Him. Now, after 40 more days, Noah opened the window. Blessed Mom, thanks for joining us. Let me have your first name and I'll call you by it. After 40 more days, Noah opened, now remember 40 means the end of testing and trial. So we have this beautiful thing going on here, this new covenant being happening here. Elevate uh, eight women, nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. After 40 more days, Noah opened the window. He had made in the ark and released a raven. Now a raven is an unclean animal. It flew back and forth from the ark until the earth was dry and it never returned to rest in the ark. We must be careful that if we want to say we walk with God, but we remain unclean, we will never enter the rest of God. Oh, you may make heaven, but, if it, you, but you may miss heaven. I can't say that you would make it. But if you continue to say, I love God with all my heart, but you keep sinning, and you won't stop sinning, and you keep walking in a, a disconnect, you're walking, you're walking, but you're asking God to walk with you instead of you walking with God. The raven was a representation of that kind of relationship. The raven could have come back to rest in the ark, but it did not. It stayed on the earth just flying and flying and flying and flying and wearing itself out and being weary and being overcome by weariness until there was enough place for it to a, 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 play, a dry place on the earth for it to land, but it never came back to the ark to rest, which it could have. And what are you doing? Are you just running and running and running, trying to do enough, trying to be enough to be accepted? Are you still trying to make God love you because you are people pleasing? Are you still trying to do enough right like you're under the old law? Are you trying to earn your place with God when he's already given it? 
How can you earn a place that's been given? It's already been given to you. There is so much here in these few verses that give you a right to enter the rest of God and enjoy the divine covenant that God has made for you. After 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark, and he released a raven, an unclean animal, and it flew back and forth from the ark until the earth was dry. It never came back. Then Noah sent out a dove to see if the waters had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove found no place to rest, so it returned to Noah in the ark because the water still covered the face of the earth, and it rested in the ark while it waited. Now here's what I want you to grab in your spirit. God has created a place of rest. That place is inside Jesus. He is our ark. He is our place to rest while we wait for things to subside, while we wait for things to recede, while we wait for things to back away from us, while we wait for the revelation and the revealing of the curse that is reversed. We can wait inside of the presence of God, inside the rest of God. Now, here's the key, though. Purification and righteousness is revealed while we wait. And the character that is being built inside of you is revealed while you wait. And if you don't like what's being revealed while in your waiting period, then you've not developed the character that you need. For waiting in the, in the Hebrew means to twist, to twirl, to intertwine together, to make strong. What is that? That's the Jewish dance. That is worship. While you wait, you are supposed to be in divine worship with the Spirit of God so that as you wait and as you worship, God is ever bringing you to a place where you can be purified, where you can be revealed as the purification and the righteousness of God. And as you come out of this, hi Cassandra, hi Lisa, thanks all of you for joining me. Hi Shadi, it's all about our waiting time. Waiting is beautiful, but it is hard. And while you wait, Whatever character you've developed or not developed, whatever character that is inside of you, it will be revealed while you wait. Waiting is not passive. Waiting is very active. It is twisting. It is twirling. It is intertwining together to make strong. And that's why the Antichrist spirit has come on the earth trying to Break, bring us, break us apart, bring us into separation so we cannot intertwine together to make strong. I'm telling you on Saturday when we had a school of worship and we got to intertwine together to make strong, we got to worship together, things began to change. And it will always begin to change in us. Uh, let me see what Colby said. Ravens land on what's dead. Doves land on what's living. That's right. And the dove could find nothing to land on. And the raven would own, it's an unclean animal. So it would land on anything dead. And it continued to fly and continued to search the whole earth over. And it never came back to the rest place of God. But we have access to the rest. After 40 days, after 40 days, after the end of testing and trial, Noah opened the window. The raven went first and then the dove. Then he sent out a dove to see if the waters had receded, but the dove found no place to rest, so it returned to Noah in the ark because the water still covered the face of the earth. Noah put out his hand and he grasped the dove and he put it back into the ark. Noah put out the dove and he brought back in the dove. Uh, say what again, Priscilla? 24 for priesthood, readiness to be in his presence. That's right. Yes, we're seeing all of this everywhere right now. Jo uh, uh, Priscilla, ask me again. I'm not sure what you want me to say again. I've said a lot. Can you ask me the question and I'll go back and say it. So he sent out a dove to see if the waters had receded, but the dove now found no place to rest. Noah put out his hand the very hand that the dove flew from will be the hand that the dove comes back to about the dove. There you go. So Noah released the dove, 
But the dove could not come back into the ark until Noah put out his hand. Jesus is the representation of that hand and the nail in his hand. He put it out and said, rest a while in my hand. Rest in my hand. So the dove came back in and he put it back into the ark. He waited another seven days, another it is finished, and that's where we get 14, the first seven and the next seven. That's the full circle. 14 means salvation and deliverance. So 14 days, on the 14th day, he sent the dove away from the ark again. Before evening, the dove came back to him, and there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So in this case, the dove is representative of the Holy Spirit, and he didn't just go and, okay, great, there's a tree I can land on, but he landed on the tree. He grabbed fruitfulness, life, something that's alive. He put it in his mouth, and he brought the living back to rest again inside the ark. Are you ever circling back to God? For that is what the throne room is all about. You are the very throne room. Do you not know, Corinthians says, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which means you are the temple, you are the tabernacle, and you have the Holy of Holies within you. And Jesus rests in you, and the Holy Spirit resides in you. So here we have the Holy Spirit residing and being sent back and forth over the whole earth, just a representation of the Holy Spirit. He finds life and he brings it back and says to Noah, there is life on the earth. There is a place. The waters are receding. Good morning, Danielle. Is that foreshadowing of anointing, being that it's olive? Yes, I believe so. And the connection between the Holy Spirit and the anointing oil. It's also a connection between the purified bride in Matthew 25, when half of the ten only had enough oil to last to that moment, and the other ten had more than enough. That's why the dove, representing the Holy Spirit, went and found the manifestation of the anointing and brought the anointing back to Noah. And I believe because of that, it brought even more ability to rest, even more ability to wait, because Noah had a portion of the anointing from the Holy Spirit so that he could rest appropriately. Good question, Colby, and good insight. You are in Bible school, you see. Right now, you are in Bible school. Uh, Noah put out his hand, grasped the dove, brought it back in. He waited another seven days. This time, the dove came back with an olive leaf that had been plucked. So Noah realized that the waters had finally subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent the dove out again. Now we're talking 21. And this position of 21, and you know we are coming up on it, in January we will enter 20, which means redeemed, and we've entered the decade of redeemed, 2021. And 21 is the year of the split. And the split happens because it is the year of rapture. Now, when I, I'm not saying that the rapture we're waiting for for the bride will happen in 2021. It very well could. But I'm saying that in the year that represents a split, rapture and exceeding sinfulness of sin, that we are going to see a great separation even greater than we've ever seen before between righteousness and unrighteousness, between holy and unholy, between those who walk with God and those who will not walk with God. A great separation is coming in just a few months. In that time frame, what am I talking about when I'm talking about rapture? I'm saying that we, the church, determine that we're finally going to be raptured from our flesh. We're going to be separated from our flesh. We're going to stop talking like the world, walking like the world, 
acting like the world, and we will come up higher to a new level of living and being and being raptured from the flesh, being raptured from carnality, being raptured from the human way of doing things, human thinking, human reasoning. We're going to step into the next level, and that's what happened here with the third circle of the do re mis each of the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Those are seven days, but it's also the do re mi fa sol la ti, the seven tones of the throne room. And as you keep circling, when you hit 21, you hit rapture or exceeding sinfulness of sin. There is nobody on the bridge. There is nobody on the fence. There is either one side or the other, and one must choose to be on it, and we must keep circling higher and higher, and to do that, we have to go lower and lower on our knees. You're right. Our humility determines our altitude. I know this is really deep, but I hope you're getting it, and I know you are if you've been to school for sure because you've heard things similar to it. Then he waited another seven days and sent the dove out again, but this time the dove did not return to him in the ark because it had found its resting place in the earth. In Noah's 601st year, now remember this happened on the 600th year, on Noah's 601st year on the first day of the first month, unison, unison, a double unison, The waters were dried up from the earth. Noah lifted the hatch, looked out, and saw the dry ground. On the 27th day of the second month, the earth was dry. Then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your wives. Release all the animals with you and set them free. Birds, animals, large and small, every living thing. And they will multiply and abound and flourish on the earth and in the sky. So Noah and his family left the ark. And every animal, large and small, every bird and crawling thing came out of the ark by families. God loves families. He calls by families, he anoints by families, he delivers by families, and he saves by families. Noah erected an altar dedicated to Yahweh. Then he selected ritually clean animals and birds of every species and offered them as a burnt offering. Hi, Prince. So glad you joined us this morning. And he offered them on the altar. And when Yahweh smelled the sweet fragrance of Noah's offerings, his heart was stirred. And he said, this is what God said. Listen to these amazing words. Never again will I curse the earth because of people. Woo! Isn't that amazing? Never again will I curse the earth because of people. Even though the imagination of their hearts are evil from their childhood, nor will I ever again destroy every living creature as I have done, I promise this. As long as the earth exists, there will always be seasons of planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. And I want to take that in a different translation there. Here, God says, as long as the earth remains, there will be, and it's a three level here, not two, seed, time, harvest. You cannot get from seed to harvest without time. There must be a three-fold cord in every seed you plant. You must be willing to wait. That's the second circle. Your waiting must be pure and holy, and you must worship God while you wait, not denying here that God has a plan to bring forth harvest. And that's that's right, exactly. Everyone, you're making note. No wonder families have been so close to my heart and also so attacked. That's right, Cassandra. There has been so much attack on the family, starting with the male, starting with the patriarchs of the family, starting with God's 
image in male form. The enemy has come after the fatherhood position. And I don't care if you're a single man, you were created to first be a son, which means covenant of the house, and then to step into the fatherhood position, whether you ever give birth to children or not, you are father once you hit a position. You go from not just being covenant of the house and life of the house, excuse me, life of the house, because your name flows through generations, but life of the house becomes strong leader of the house. And you'll never be able to be a strong leader of the house, men, until you learn how to be the life of the house. You must walk in the life of God. And as you walk in the life of God, you mature and grow into this great strong leader. And when men step into their position as strong leaders in the spiritual house of God, we will see a great release of the power of God in churches. We will see a great release of the power of God in our nation, in our families. And again, I'm not talking about people giving birth to children. I'm talking about God's positions of male. First, they began the life of the house as sons, and they grow up. And when I become a man, I become a strong leader of the house of God. And when that happens, Harry loves to give that percentage. I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, if a child gets saved first in a family, it's, it's like 3% that the whole family will get saved. And if the mother gets saved first, it's like 17% that the family gets saved. But if the father gets saved in the family first, it is a 93% chance that the whole family will be saved. And that is the importance of the life of the house and the strong leader of the house. And that's why the Antichrist spirit has come so strongly against the patriarchs, against the father position. He wants to wipe out the fatherhood on the earth. And again, I'm not talking about giving birth to children. I'm talking about the leadership of godly positions, fathering fathering and overseeing and covering and protecting all those of us who are in the house. We need strong leaders of the house. We need men who know that they are the life of the house, stepping into position of manhood, becoming strong leaders of the house. And we pray it, we believe it, we confess it. And this is why Noah is the first one mentioned. His righteousness created righteousness within the whole family. His righteousness saved his wife, his three sons, and his three sons' wives, none of which were righteous enough to enter the ark, God says. None of them, but the covering of the Father created righteousness within the family, and they were all saved because of it. I'm telling you, this is the most powerful revelation. If we would get it, and we would pray it, and we would stand in the gap for the men, God can reverse the curse on the land of America. God can reverse the curse and push back the spirit of the Antichrist, and the spirit of the Antichrist must recede off of the face of the earth so that the spirit of God can come forth, bringing forth seed, time, harvest. Woo! I'm looking for a harvest of souls. I'm looking for a heart of purity. I'm looking for a heart of worship to be birthed upon the earth. We need a harvest of worship to come out of this thing. We need a harvest of worship. The first thing Noah did as his foot stepped onto land was he built an altar and he created sacrifices unto God so that the sweet smelling savor of the aroma of his worship could be smelled in by our almighty God. And I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, the moment, the very first thing that happened after the flood was worship means that that is continuing as long as the earth remains. There will be seed. That's our offering. Time. That's the development of our offering. And harvest. That is the full fruitfulness of our offering coming forth. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for what you are doing in our land, in our churches, in our nation. We thank you, Father, for your spirit moving. We thank you, Father, for our men arising and taking their place. Iron men, as my husband calls them, strong men who are not moved, who are not moved by the culture of this age or the culture of this world. Thank you, Father, that you're bringing unity. You're bringing unity, Father. Thank you. As, as 
as my husband began to sing on Sunday and it began to move me so much, I began to cry because he began to sing this little children's song that we that we sang in Sunday school as a, in Bible, uh, vacation Bible school as a child. He said, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. We can bring forth unity in the body of Christ when we begin to prophesy that God loves every color. This skin, this skin, this is not what this is about. I'm telling you, we are all made in the image of God. God loves us all. He sent his grace for all. He sent his mercy for all. He sent his redemption for all. And we must love the body of Christ. We must love one another. We must be kind to one another. We must act like a family. It is time for the body of Christ to act like a family. And we got to care. Remember when I was teaching in Ezekiel, how God started at the altar and he marked the head of those who cared about the atrocities going on at that time. God marked their head and said, they care, don't kill them. And everyone who didn't get marked with the caring mark they were killed starting at the altar and went throughout the nation. It went from the altar into the inner court, into the outer court, and out into the nation. And anyone who was not caring, who did not care like God cares, who did not love like God loves, who did not pray and stand on the wall and become involved in what God is doing, it is time, church, to arise. It is time that we act like the body, look like the body, talk like the body, work Worship like the body of Christ. I'm telling you, I get so excited what God is doing in this earth. It is time for us to act like it. It was one year and 17 days that they were in the ark. One year and 17 days. And on the 27th day, the scripture said, on the 27th day, I want to read that to you one more time. And I want to make a note. On the 27th day, of the second month. Now, second means unity. So now they're walking as unity. The earth was dry. Unison goes into unity, do, re. And when you have the 27th, I want to read to you what 27 means in, in the ancient Hebrew. 27, this number is found very few times in the Bible. The author has searched the scriptures and it seems that this number is made up of a combination of numbers that reveals the preaching of the gospel. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, there is listed 17 qualifications for the preacher of the gospel. Number 17 is the number for victory. Number 10 is the number for the law. Now, I want you to notice these numbers I'm giving you. Together, they give us the number 27, which attests to the fact that the preacher is one who gives his testimony of victory that the good news, the gospel, overcomes and frees from the law and gives victory to the life of the believer. I'm telling you that God is releasing inside of us today. The preaching of the gospel has to become a way of life for us. We must walk in the unity with God. We must walk in the unison, walking with God. His frequency becomes our frequency. His tone becomes our tone. We determine that we are not asking God to walk with us anymore, but we determine in our heart that we will walk with God. And that's right. 17 means victory. 10 means not just law. It means law, testimony, and responsibility. It is the law of the bride of Christ. It is not natural law. It is not even Mosaic law. It is the law of the being born again and married, the bride being married to the bridegroom. So that law means unity. It means covenant. It means responsibility to be who he created us to be through the divine covenant of oneness with him. So, wow. Okay. A whole nother level, right? A whole nother level. Law, testimony, and responsibility. That's right. We are walking in the victory of being married to Christ, his bride, giving our testimony and walking out the responsibility of being his very image. I love you all with all my heart. I know I went a little long this morning, but wow, those numbers, I wanted to make sure I didn't come 
cover them too quickly or that you had opportunity to follow along. Don't forget you can go over to our YouTube channel and you can watch this slowly. You can push pause and take notes if you would like. And also, don't forget, we will be in Riverside tonight on uh, Trail Creek Road uh, with uh, Pastors Tom and Heather Flores at the, at the Elevate Life Church. So, 7 o'clock tonight. So, if you're in the area, please come. If you are not in the area, will you please uh, make a note of the time change wherever you are and pray for our services for souls, 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 souls in the name of Jesus. So, I love you with all my heart. I will see you tomorrow.